Hello, and welcome to Partially Redacted, a podcast where we discuss privacy and security engineering and related topics. I'm your host, Sean Falkner, and today I'm joined by Ram Muthakrishnan, Senior Product Manager at Skyfog, and we'll be talking about Data Protection 101, concepts like redaction, masking, encryption, and the other core sort of technical concepts involved with protecting sensitive customer data. Ram, welcome to the show. Hey, Sean. Thanks for being mate. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah. Well, let's start with some basics. Who are you? What do you do? And how'd you end up where you are today? Sure. I'm going to go away, um, go all the way uh, back to my um, starting role as a developer. So I started my career as a software developer at a gaming company that designed casino games in India. You know, casinos weren't the thing in India back then. And I believe they still aren't. So as a developer, I'd wonder who we are building for, what kind of problems we were solving, and how they were actually using what we built. Uh, so this planted the seed for product management as a career path, uh, which was a very nascent job at the time. Fast forward a few years, I came to the Bay Area, started in an implementation role um, at a startup called HelloSign. One thing led to another, and then I was able to transition into a PM role. Uh, then we were acquired by Dropbox, um, and then spent a couple of years there, then left to Roku um, to lead their consumer privacy effort. Um, so this was an exciting opportunity. I was always interested in privacy fits. In fact, I majored in cybersecurity and privacy during my master's. So I jumped on it. And then uh, my team at Roku worked on a number of privacy-related projects, ranging all the way from ads controls to GDPR, CCPAs, regulations, to how to securely share data with partners without compromising privacy. Then I found Kaismo earlier this year and it's been a roller coaster right since then. So it sounds like your first sort of official role in the world of, of, of privacy, even though you had an interest in it and you did some work during your master's degree and it was at Roku, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. What were some of sort of the warnings that you, uh, you know, came to during that experience? Yeah, so I think uh, what I didn't um, appreciate enough is that like how much bigger problem privacy was really uh, to tackle uh, when, when you have like core business to take care of. Uh, so that was a challenge. So we had a fully staffed team. Even then, it was difficult to like prioritize, get buy-in, work with leadership, and then uh, like work on uh, initiatives that will improve consumer privacy. Um, and another challenge that we faced was also like how spread out data was and how hard it was to gain that uh, uh, at a later stage um, in the company's journey. You know, why do you think it is that, you know, essentially protecting sensitive customer data and, and like, you know, consumer privacy ends up kind of being one of these initiatives within an organization that maybe doesn't it's not necessarily the P0. Like, it's not the highest priority thing. It's something that kind of always gets, like, pushed to the side. And, uh, you know, wh why do you think that is? I think everybody has their core business to take care of. And so far, uh, that's been the focus area. But we are seeing more and more uh, importance to, like, building that trust with customers, right? Customers are learning about these incidents and um, how their data gets used or misused. Um, all that is being uh, like being um, the companies are getting aware of all those uh, incidents, and they want to like do the best thing for their business and also their users for their users as well. So I think yeah, companies are seeing um, how it could impact their business, um, like not taking care of privacy. So um, yeah, I would say like it, it's still a long journey. Uh, but that's the primary reason they make the core focus on their business area. It's worth it's taking uh, so long for companies to focus on privacy. Yeah. And in, in a way, I feel like uh, companies should also like shift uh, from just like considering privacy as an add-on or um, an afterthought. And then they like, should really think hard uh, doing it the right way. Uh, and then that will be much easier in the longer run rather than just like satisfying a regulation out a lot. Right. And, you know, and if you sort of do it um, sort of more from like a first principle standpoint, then maybe you don't reach the state that you, some of the challenges that you saw maybe at Roku where, 
you know, essentially the data ends up everywhere and it becomes like a real headache to even, and it, you know, track down all the places that you need to even, even protect it. This sort of concept of like secure by default, uh, is like rather than something that's like bolted on. Exactly. Yeah. Privacy by design. I think, um, it's started to getting noticed and appreciated by everybody now and should have happened a few years back though. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least we're getting there better late than never. So we're talking, you know, sort of data protection 101. So, so, so some of the like core, you know, technologies and approaches to protecting data. And maybe a good place to start would be there's all these different concepts like, you know, redaction, masking, encryption, tokenization. What are some of the key differences between these different sort of approaches to data protection? Sure. Um, so I think, yeah, let's dive into the basics of um, some of these concepts, right? Like starting with redaction. Um, so in simple terms, Redaction is removing sensitive data from the source, so it can be shared widely uh, without compromising individual use of privacy. Say you have a legal document with sensitive data, redaction is like using a thick black marker over it to remove any sensitive information. Um, so it's not reversible, uh, but uh, it, it, it helps with maintaining privacy there. So that's redaction. Um, then masking, masking is hiding part of the, hiding or obscuring part of the sensitive data without changing the format or length. Uh, so it's still usable, but when compromised, doesn't give away sensitive data. Um, so an example here would be a real credit card number could be obscured except for the last four digits. So it can be reversed if you have the right access and if you want to. Um, but otherwise, uh, for any onlookers or like, so-called shoulder surface, it protects the sensitive data. And then um, encryption. So encryption um, is like putting your message into a box with a lock on it for which the key is only with you and your intended recipient. So without the key, the box is useless and your message can't be read, even if it is uh, intercepted uh, while, it's being, um, while it's reaching your recipient. And then uh, finally, tokenization. Uh, um, is like substituting your sensitive data for a random value, also called as token. Whenever you need to store the sensitive data, you use the token instead of uh, using the real data to protect it. When you actually need it, you exchange the token for the data. Uh, so in this case, even if you get breached, that attacker is left with random tokens of no use, uh, whereas your data is sitting safely in a uh, warrant. I see. So... You know, going back to the, the start there, you know, you first talked about this idea of redaction and, you know, I think the analogy there is like, let's just take like a black marker and black out, you know, the things that are sensitive in a document in the computational world, that's, you know, maybe just completely replacing whatever is sensitive with, uh, you know, nothing or, you know, a word that says redacted or something like that. And so obviously there's like, if there's value to that, if essentially the thing that you need to deliver to somebody they need to have some part of that document, but not all of it. And, and they can just blank, re, re, you know, redact it. But then there's other scenarios where we might want to give them partial information, like the, the idea of masking. So when it comes to masking, like what are some of the different like approaches to actually creating a mask? Yeah, totally. I could give that stuff on it a bit, right? Like, so one is partial mask, where you're only uh, hiding part of that data. So this could be, for example, in your phone number, you're just like hiding the last four digits uh, or like uh, showing the last four digits, but hiding everything else. So that's all a customer service representative would need to verify a user, right? So that is partial masking. Like you don't expose the full number and uh, they can still do their job of verifying that user. That's partial mask. And then in some cases, you don't want to sh uh, show anything. That is a full mask where you want to like, hide everything from the system, right? Like if I know the last four digits of your assistant, I can use it as well. So you might want to just use the full mask for that purpose. So that is one type. And then there's also different like character substitution. So where you can hide certain characters in your input so that it still makes sense to the intended user, but doesn't make any sense for anybody looking at it. So I'd say like, yeah, these are like some approaches um, and, and these keep evolving as well. When it comes to things like encryption, so I think you did a you know a nice job of sort of explaining the basics of it. Essentially, you're you know you're you're basically locking up the data, and then only you have the key, or maybe you share the key with certain types of people. But there's lots of different approaches to encryption, and there's also 
things like symmetric and asymmetric encryption. So maybe you can give a little bit of background and context around what is the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption and when should each of those be used? Yeah, sure. Um, so at a high level, right, like encryption is taking an input and then transforming it into a form that's unreadable uh, to anyone who doesn't have the appropriate keys. Um, so let's um, look at make some of the components, right? Like, so there is plain text, which is your data. Then there is cipher text, which is the encrypted form of your data. And then there is encryption algorithm, which is what converts your plain text into cipher text. And then finally, uh, if the key, which the algorithm uses to perform that encryption. Uh, so these are some of the basic components of encryption, right? Like now, like you mentioned, there are two types um, and there are like some important nuance between these two types, right? Like symmetric and asymmetric. Symmetric encryption is basically using the same key for both encryption and decryption. So I send you a message, uh, you and I have the same key, we can access that message. But as in asymmetric encryption, uh, you have your own key, a pair of keys. And then I use your public key to encrypt that message. You have your own private key and you can decrypt that message. Nobody else can decrypt it without that priority, right? So those are the different forms of encryption. Now coming on to like when one might use each of these, there's certainly advantages and disadvantages uh, to both, right? So in symmetric encryption, uh, there is no key exchange. Uh, so then there is key exchange, right? Like, so that's the high risk there. So you are, like, if somebody intercepts my key, then they can read it as well in addition to you. So that's a big risk with symmetric encryption. But symmetric encryption is more efficient and faster just because of the mathematical um, computations involved are simple there. Um, going on to asymmetric encryption, so there it's slower compared to symmetric. Uh, again, it's complex mathematical operation, and that's the reason. Uh, but as key management, though, is much simpler because you're not exchanging anything here. You have your own public and private keys. I use your key to uh, public key to encrypt the data. So, in a real world scenario, um, symmetric encryption could be used uh, in places where you have like high trust with parties that you're interacting with, right? Like maybe a private network or an internal network. Asymmetric encryption might be well suited for places where you don't know who you're interacting with, but still need to do that transaction, right? Like on an internet or something. And I've seen more, most commonly, like I've seen uh, both of these symmetric and asymmetric encryptions used together, right? Like which is what we call hybrid encryption, where you use asymmetric encryption to exchange the symmetric key and then encrypt the data using symmetric encryption. So this way we get the benefits of both and uh, do what's efficient. I see. And then I think a lot of times when it is for people who are, you know, maybe not like deeply uh, involved in the space of, you know, data privacy, data security, they naturally think about encryption as the way to essentially protect data. So what are the situations where, or maybe the limitations of purely using encryption to protect data? Like where does that start to maybe not serve certain types of use cases? Yeah, totally. I think, um, yeah, whenever I say that I work for Skyflow and like uh, when I try to explain what we do, the first question that comes up is, so you do encryption, right? And my response is always like, uh, there's like a lot more to it. Right? Like so encryption, while it's a great uh, tool, it doesn't solve for everything. So you can encrypt your data I think encryption, it's really good for transferring data, securing the data while it's in transit and, it in, and when it's at storage. But when you actually want to use it, that's where the challenge, challenge comes because every time you want to access that data, you have to decrypt it to make any use of it. Right? So if you, and if, if you have, let's say like you're in a large company and multiple department needs to access that data, then you're going to share the key with many people involved there. And then that increases the risk exponentially. And even with those keys, each operation or each process need to decrypt and get that data, which might also like look at like some performance implications there. So I feel like encryption, while it's a great tool, it's not for every use case. Um, it, it does a good job of protecting data at transit and rest, but uh, for use, it has a lot of like pain points. Listen, yeah, absolutely. And until we have essentially like 
fully homomorphic encryption, then we don't really have approached to, uh, to, to using it uh, as well. Uh, so essentially we're restricted to protecting the data in transit, protecting it in storage. But if we need to search the data, then we run into these you know, challenges and limitations. Yeah, we are making some steps there with our polymorphic en encryption and homomorphic encryption, but yeah, still a long journey though. Yeah, and I guess another challenge if, if you're purely using encryption for data protection is too, is it doesn't really help solve the data duplication problem where you could have the data encrypted at rest in your database, but then you might also have it encrypted, you know, in a log file, encrypted in a warehouse or like wherever else you might be storing the information, the backups and stuff like that. So you you still end up with this like data replication problem that it's better than having it in plain text, but essentially, you, you know, if, if there is a compromise, you got to go and like rotate the keys in all those places, or uh, you just essentially open up more potential attack vectors because you have the data copied all these places. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So data sprawl is another challenge that most companies face uh, and yeah, encryption doesn't really sound for that. Hey, it's Sean, host of the show you're listening to. First and foremost, I hope you're enjoying the interview. And if you are, please support the show by subscribing and leaving a positive rating and review. And if you want to keep the conversation going, join our community at skyflow.com slash community. Okay, that's it for me. Now back to the show. Now, in terms of tokenization, I think a lot of times for people who are, you know, know maybe know a little bit or they've ever done like integration with a payment service provider, we often kind of associate tokenization with payment data. So essentially, to instead of handling credit card directly, you know, we're, we're essentially handling some sort of tokenized form of that. But we can apply that, you know, idea that essentially any kind of, you know, PII or sensitive data. But what are maybe some of the advantages or when it makes sense to use tokenization that maybe, you know, uh, you know, is a stand in or it makes, maybe helps alleviate some of these challenges that you see or limitations with a pure encryption approach. Yeah, totally. Um, so I think, yeah, the reason why tokenization is often brought up in the context of payments is because it makes it easy uh, to comply with PCI standards, right? Which is needed if you're doing payments. Uh, but it does have much wider use and has several advantages um, among all the protection, data protection techniques that we discussed today. Um, so backing up a bit, like the tokenization in simple terms is substitution. So you have something uh, some sensor data, you exchange it for a token uh, from a token efficient provider, you then start using the token everywhere. Uh, and only when you absolutely need it, you exchange that token and get back value, right? So with this approach, since you never really store any sensor data on your infrastructure, uh, when a breach happens, you're not impacted at all. And the recent Capital One breach, uh, it's a great example for this. So they, they had 100 million records um, and the attacker got access to all of it, but all of it was tokenized. So the financial implications for that uh, was very low. And then um, the liability also reduces with tokenization, right? Because the tokens are unrelated to the original data. So risk of identity theft, fraud, credit monitoring, you don't have to worry about any of those, right? Um, again, this played out uh, perfectly in capital ones incident. Then um, compliance, right? Like, so when, you, when you're looking at compliance, tokenization uh, limits a lot of the scope uh, right? because you don't really have anything sensitive in your environment. So you can get faster compliance uh, the right way. So that's one. And then finally, I think tokenization gives you a lot of like, flexibility. So if you're dealing with payments, you can transition between different payment processes without being locked into one. And also, like, this gives you, like, nice uh, interoperability to uh, try out different payment processes. Can it also be used to help solve some of the, you know, maybe search problems that you're going to run into with a pure encryption approach? Yeah, absolutely. So there are, like, different types of tokens. So you can get random tokens, format preserving tokens, which are a little more, like, flexible and give you the ability to, like, do fuzzy thirds and things like that, uh, and even with tokens. And then what are some of the limitations, though, of a pure tokenization approach? You know, I think with any of these um, techniques, they're like, they don't seem, you know, they don't solve everything, essentially. It's like the combination of things that uh, maybe is like a, the right approach. But what are the limitations of, of, of a pure tokenization approach? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Like, so no tool is 
uh, perfect for everything, right? Like, so both tokenization and encryption are great tools, but uh, usually like you combine them to get the better use of it, right? Um, so tokenization does definitely have some disadvantages, right? Like, so you need to, uh, one thing to keep in mind when you're looking for a tokenization platform is that like it needs to have high availability because your sensitive data is going to be with them. And then you also want it, want it to scale well uh, as you grow and as your use gifts become complex, you want the platform to grow with you, right? Uh, so those are some uh, key things to uh, pay attention to. And then you could use tokenization in combination with encryption, right? Like, so maybe you tokenize the data, but when, it, when you transfer it, you still encrypt it. And when it is at rest, you still encrypt it, right? So that way you protect it in all cases. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And then what about in terms of access control? So even if I'm using something like tokenization, I'm able to de-scope my existing infrastructure from seeing the you know plain text data. But at some point, I'm probably going to need to be able to like re-identify that data to show account information to a customer support person or to the person who actually owns the data. Yeah, totally. I think access control is one of the core pillars of data security. Like at SkyClue, we have this three-step approach for data privacy, um, isolate, govern, and protect. So once you isolate your sensitive data into the wall, if you don't govern um, access to, your, to it, you can't really protect it, right? So if uh, this is where access controls come into play. So if you don't control that, then somebody can detokenize it, get that sensitive data. However, you you can like you protect it into the wall. Um, so you can basically group access controls into two major buckets, right? like authentication and then authorization. So authentication is when you decide um, I, how to verify users um, really like who they say they are, right? Simply put, do they have keys to the front door? Uh, common methods include passwords, uh, MFAs, uh, biometrics, and uh, smart cards. And then uh, when it comes to authorization, so this is verifying if the user has access to actions uh, that they are actually trying to perform. Simply put, like once they get in the house, what can they do? Usually this is done based on roles, permissions, policies, uh, or even contextual information like location or time of the day uh, can decide what access the user has. At SkyClo, we also have a more advanced model, which we call context-aware authorization. Here, we have a claim for a user, each end user, and that end user claim determines what the user can access or modify in that data privacy world. And then what are some of the best practices when it comes to like actually implementing effective access control measures? Yeah, I think it's usually a combination of um, having the right tech process and training. Uh, starting with technology, like, like the number of ways to enforce data security uh, through uh, SSO, MFA, but these decisions, we should keep in mind that should be based on sensitivity of the data involved. Otherwise, you're going to cause like, friction to regular workflows and employees are not going to like it. Then on process, there should be periodic updates, password changes, backups, disaster recovery, logging and monitoring, etc. And finally, I think the key piece, which many companies overlook, is adequately training on common ways attackers gain access to critical systems, such as phishing, social engineering, and, and so on. How do you, you know, I think like a lot of times when we think about data security, we're adding sort of more and more systems in place to protect the data. It makes it harder to sort of like actually use the data. So how, how can you kind of like balance the need for security on the data and applying these different techniques with actually giving accessibility to the data for authorized personnel or to, to run certain types of workloads? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's where like we discussed, right? Like, so there is no one side, one side fits all. You should take a cautious approach. First, you need to like inventory what you actually have and then um, assess uh, what the sensitivity of that particular piece of data is. Then based on that, you need to choose the right tool. Could be tokenization, encryption, depending on the use case. And then actually rolling it out and monitoring it, like, like enforcing it. Uh, so I think, yeah, uh, it should be a combination and... Uh, that, that's how you like balance both usability and uh, security. I mean, how's like the concept of like zero trust? Like, uh, where how's that play a role in in essentially like so, like data protection? And what does zero trust when it comes to data really mean? Yeah, I think zero trust is uh, it, it's it's a phenomenon everywhere, right? Like, so you don't want to like so the 
once you have complaints, people think that like you, your data is safe and everything, but really like the attack could come from anywhere. Uh, so that's where zero trust comes into a uh, picture, right? Like, so you want to treat everybody as a potential risk to the sensitive data, and then you should design and architect your solutions um, that way. Yeah, actually, it, there was uh, just recently in the news, um, uh, well, actually, Retool pu- published this. They published a blog post about an attack that they just had. So there's a bunch of things that went into it. Uh, I, I really, anybody listening, I encourage you to check out the blog post and I'll include it in the show notes because it's really fascinating the amount of effort that the attacker went into using a combination of social engineering and deep fakes and all this sort of stuff. But I think like the, the, the really big takeaway that I had from sort of reading the, the impact of the breach was it was relatively low. And I think a big part of that was because Retool was doing a lot of the right things when it comes to you know, using essentially principle of isolation and also zero trust. So even though the attacker gained access, they ended up gaining access to very little information. Exactly, yeah. What do you see as some of the like common misconceptions or maybe challenges when it comes to implementing some of these data protection techniques? Yeah, there's, there are many. Uh, so I'll talk about some of my favorites uh, that I hear often. So people usually think complaints um, equal security, right? Like where... Uh, once you get a certain level of compliance, you are like secure, your data is secure. Companies should start seeing this as meeting the bare minimum and ask for it to go beyond, right? Because attackers know too well about the controls of some of these compliances and they'll focus on other things to break your system, right? Uh, so that's the first uh, misconception. Uh, and then the second one, uh, I think that like in, for the first one, zero trust makes total sense, right? Like, like how we discussed, like you should go beyond compliance and you'll be like well set up if you use zero trust. And then um, second, there is also this mindset of you're too small to be attacked um, among companies. Um, you know what? Um, attackers think the same way. So since you're small, you might lack the control and might be an easy target to make some quick money. Uh, so I think that's ton of there. Then uh, uh, I think this, this one is my favorite. It's we encrypt data so we are safe. Um, I hear it all the time. Uh, and going back to the Capital One incident, right? Like, so though they were able to um, secure 100 million records with tokenization, they would still find $150 million uh, because w- 1 million records were using encryption and the keys got to the attacker. So you can see like how much of a difference uh, uh, it makes to choose the right tool uh, and not just over rely on encryption. Yeah, even in the case where the attacker didn't necessarily get the encryption key, I think even in that situation, there's uh, it, it essentially has more impact because in theory, they, if they actually had the raw data, they have a little time in the world to potentially try to break the encryption, even if it's not very likely to happen. Essentially, like there's no way to to like prevent the person from you know trying to brute force the whatever the encryption scheme is. Yeah, encryption has strong types of the data. So yeah, that'll be right. Yeah, and I think you made a really good point around um, potentially, you know, compliance doesn't equal security. There's many, many companies that have all the, you know, essentially compliance certificates that you can name that are, have had major data breaches. So, you know, they're doing all the things right from a compliance standpoint, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing everything sort of above and beyond that to actually protect the data. Yeah. What are some of the like emerging trends or maybe technologies in this field that you know people should be aware of that or that you're particularly excited about? Yes, um, I think AI um, and ML. Um, it's been the rage for quite some time um, for uh, and in cybersecurity too for threat detection, and I think it's going to be huge to anticipate and prevent attacks um, even in the next few years. There's been a lot of progress, but I think only in the last few years these AI tools have become democratized. Uh, this is. This means attackers now also have much more sophisticated tools. Right? They can clone your voice. They can do social engineering, sophisticated attacks. Uh, so I think AI and ML should be used uh, to evolve with this uh, with this changing threat landscape. And I think that's going to be key in the next few years. Yeah, one of the first uses of machine learning was really used, uh, I guess sort of commercial uses were used around fraud detection, threat detection, spam detection, and so on. And, um, you know, they've been working in that space for a, for a long time. But now, of course, 
with all these, essentially, uh, everything that's coming out from in, in the gen AI world, we're, we're creating a lot of tools that can also be used for attacks. And essentially the, the, you know, I guess like the, the, the good side of the industry also needs to react and use these tools and leverage them to better protect these different systems. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and another trend I want to talk about briefly is also on secure multi-party computation. Um, so this is an exciting field where this is a cryptographic technique that helps in analyzing sensitive data without uh, compromising privacy. Right? It could be your salary, healthcare information, all that. Uh, so you have confidential computing um, uh, and then secure enclaves, which are also like the same uh, uh, trend to protect you for data uh, without, uh, but making it still usable at scale. Yeah, and those, we actually have separate episodes on both of those concepts, which I, uh, um, I'm glad you mentioned. Uh, they're both you know, super fascinating. I think there's a lot going on in the space around secure for enclaves right now from essentially all the major public cloud providers um, are you know, heavily investing in that, in that area. Yeah, I'm excited to take it out. Good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, well, thank you so much, Ram. As we start to wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to share? Uh, no, I think... Um... One thing that I'd say is that uh, companies need to start thinking about uh, sort of architecting solutions in the right way. Uh, privacy by designing, privacy by engineering. Uh, these are all like, I, I'm hearing a lot about these, but I still yet to see that like play out. Like, like, and uh, yeah, I think trying to do the bare minimum won't work anymore. Um, and companies should take a hard look and uh, apply it uh, for the future. Yeah, and I think that the landscape beyond just like from regulations, but from consumer expectations changing as well, where, you know, I think consumers are a lot more aware and you know, sort of wise to the fact of all the abuse of their data that's been going on for the last like 40 years. So their expectations, I think, from companies is becoming, is, is, is getting uh, higher as well. So if you want to be, I think, on the, you know, sort of looking towards the future, creating uh, a, a differentiated experience for your consumers and also meeting your need, then this has to be something that's a priority from day one. Yeah, I'm very happy. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we'll have to have you back down the road. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And I, hopefully people who are you know interested in this topic can uh, you know start to dip their toes in the world of uh, data protection. Thanks, Son. I had a lot of fun too. Cheers. Cheers.